and we are up. What's going on, everybody? This is a happy Father's Day special. I am your host for today, this week, next week, last year, and until they cut my fucking lights off. Uh, it is your boy, Vanessa Veli, and I am here himself by the man that can lift more than 700 pounds. Don't get him on that, though. You know, he may not want to do it. And he can also date your wife. Uh, my boy, Def No Big. What's up with y'all, man? It's Duff no Bear. You can follow me on, on Twitter, Instagram. You can follow me on any of your respective platforms where I'll be trolling that. And today, as you know, there's a third person in our, our weird, anonymous, like, square boxes. But we have another person who's been in Los Angeles, Washington, whatever, DMV, whatever's the difference, L.A., Philadelphia, New York, out of Harlem. He's an H-Town cat himself. My boy, Doc Lou Allen. Doc Lou Allen, what's going on, man? Appreciate for having me. I'm doing well. Happy Father's Day. Happy Juneteenth Day. Love. Oh shit! Yeah, word. It's definitely Juneteenth Day. We, we gonna get it. We gonna get into Juneteenth. I'm off. <laughs> I'm off tomorrow for Juneteenth. Oh, that's we gonna good. get into that. We gonna get into that. So, I mean, at, our podcast really isn't you know interview style, but I do you know I do want to let people know like just just go ahead and go into what you do, who you are, and I got a couple questions, but like we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of some fun shit today. So just go ahead. Floor is yours. Um, my real name is Doc Juan Lou Allen, but I just go by Doc because people pronouncing my first name could get um, annoying. Like, I don't know. They'd be mis- mis- saying that. I don't got time to correct everybody. And Doc just flows better when you see it. It looks better, like, on bylines. I'm from born and raised in Harlem, New York, like, original, like, Harlem, New York. I'm not like um, like the rappers you see who may live in the Bronx, but lived in Harlem for two years. Like, I was born and raised. Harlem Hospital, went to high school. Well, I went to Carnegie Hayes High School, it's an old boys Catholic school, it was in the Bronx, mm-hmm. but it's right, it's basically Harlem, like it's one stop away is Harlem. So um, went to Catholic school my whole life. Um, I mean, that don't really mean nothing, but in New York, it's like a uh, Catholic school in New York is, is different than Catholic yeah. school anywhere else I feel like, or maybe Philly, Philly probably the same, but people go, black people, we go to Catholic school because that's where like the sports teams is, like the football teams. and. Um, basketball or like the the team. So, um, but if I went to public school, the teams is not in like a high enough division. Like I was, like I always want to play basketball and football. So, um, and my mom first went to Hayes. The first sport football season come first. So I, I made a football team, tried out, and everything made it. Started on both sides, but it's my first time putting on pads. So then um, I realized I wasn't. Once you put those pads on, it's a little different. So I'm like, yeah, let me go. Let me go talk about sports now. I, because I <laughs> yeah. basketball, basketball was over already. I couldn't because by the time basketball season came and trying out, my body was so soft. Them, them practices in football is different, man. I, I, when you have to really wake up, we had two a days. I'm like, yeah, I ain't, I'm not trying out for basketball. And then my, I don't think my grades were slipping because I ain't gonna lie. I'm gonna tell you, the type of student I was. Um, I always I, type of student I am. I just like to get by, like. Um, I had goals, so my goals was to like be what I'm doing now, but one day be on TV doing it, like maybe like ESPN or Fox Sports, whatever. Talking about sports, but um, I always had goals, and I never took school like serious. I never seen a difference in definitely in high school or college where like you getting straight A's, valedictorian, and I'm getting to see I think diploma. You know, once you got to college, you being valedictorian, okay, that's cool. You ran for Mr. or whatever, Mrs. or whatever, you as class president is cool. I graduated C, you graduate with an A plus. These jobs don't ask for that at all. So I, I just always wanted to do the eat, have fun and do the easy. I'll take the C and I'm good. But um so yeah, I, I learned that from George Bush though. I <laughs> he, he said that one time. I know he did not, but I learned it from him. Um graduate You're probably from- the only person that learned something from George Bush, but go ahead. <laughs> I benefited off of George Bush. No child left behind. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> easy route. Gradu- yeah, I had a very easy route. Graduated from Hayes, went to um, two year school originally, got my associates. Then I went to Hayes, made a Magic and Mass Communications. Graduated from there. My first job out of there, I worked at a. Um, actually, my first job was the summertime. So I just graduated in May. I got my first job in June. I worked at the Sixes Camp. I'm at six to camp. I did. Uh, I worked out with the uh, international players. Um, just did like what I did. I basically like a coach for them, like assistant coach, and just working out, workouts. And it was it was a, like a summer camp thing. Then um, I went 
my my real first job I called full time was working at um, a TV station called Newsmax. Now they call that the Trump station. I didn't oh, at that wow. time. It wasn't the Trump station at first, but um, that's that's just what it turned into. I left there for reasons. Went to overtime. That was like one of my my favorite jobs working at the overtime because um, they was like all my age. Like my boss probably was twenty seven, and his boss was twenty nine. It was crazy. Mm. At that time, I was 23, probably 24. So it was like we were all the same age. Those people, I was doing um, an overtime app at the time. It was a new app. Um, it's, it's out. It's still out to, to this day. But yeah. when I first started, I was one of the first five writers on the app. So we launched the app. And um, then I was covering basketball games um, until maybe like March, because Corona hit. Once Corona hit, um, I was... Um, this is what all I was still in New York, by the way. Mm-hmm. Corona hit, and I was like, "Damn, I my mom was getting annoying. She was like, I couldn't just stay in my mom's house no more. Like I needed to just get out. So after yeah. um, like around September, I was like, let me just go to Delaware because I went I went to Delaware if I could be in the middle between D.C., um, Baltimore, Philly, and South Jersey. Mm-hmm. All of those areas had sports teams." So um, I moved to Delaware to be in the middle, got the job at MC Sports. So I never lived in DC. I just traveled there to go to work. So I traveled like an hour and 40 minutes to go to work. DC, I was working with the Washington football team, the Washington Capitals and the Washington Wizards. After that, I went to, I worked at the Delaware News Journal for like a fellowship. Um, that's when I got like my real like journalism. And then I ended up at PHL 17. Somebody is life is being saved right now. Oh my gosh! But um, I want I want to go back a little bit. So you know, you were talking about working for overtime. Now, when I was in high school, a lot of things were new, right? I, I was in high school from 2012 to 2016. So it's like okay. you had before that it was really only ESPN. But now you had the boom of Bleacher Report. Even when I was on Bleacher, started on Bleacher Report, like it was still relatively new. You had overtime, you know, and then you started having all these other little things pop up, you know, like Ball's Life, all these other things. So just talk to me a little bit about like how, you know, you said your boss, that's a whole different work environment. It's a place that you've probably been where everybody is under 30. You know, it's definitely a crazy work environment. I've been in places where my oldest boss was like 32. And that I know from where, you know, where I've worked then, to like how things may look currently it's like that's that's a completely different work environment like did you enjoy doing that like explain to me how like your work-life balance was with that yeah so working overtime it's crazy a lot of these jobs i had was remote i just got lucky and this before covid i don't know Mm. so so overtime was a remote job because we worked on the digital app so i was just i was they would give us um they lead past description i'll watch the game and then I would just analyze it to tell them what I saw, what I seen, who's the key contributors, but in the overtime voice. Um, I did like it um, because we all had, they understood and they understand the mindset. But I, for me, um, I'm just different in my mind. I didn't want, I felt like it was a little, I don't say easy, but I wasn't going to get better and upgrade my career at um, overtime because, um, like, I feel like overtime is better when you older and you want to come to there and then kind of like I'm gonna say chill, but it's more like um, like it's not it's not the same. It's just not the same work environment as you working at ESPN or Fox or NBC because they want you like they want to be more like like old school. Like overtime is like more chill. Like you know if you want to relax, like you don't have to. They like they good. Like I'm with the first time June when June team happened. And looked out. It was like now you, you you could be off. Like they would they like they like today. Like they 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 take care of their people. But um, but you I don't for me as a young person coming in, I don't think I was gonna get better at being like a journalist or something. That's not what they are. They're not newspaperish. Like they're not. Uh, I'm doing a video package and I'm interviewing a guest like that. I wasn't gonna get better there at that. So uh, mm-hmm. that's why I felt like it just based off of what you. I feel like I'll be maybe like 20 years from now going back to overtime and being like the um the vp or something yeah because you i already know you're not you're not doing nothing like crazy like it's so for you it just wasn't a lot of upward mobility for you like that's more so like people's final stop rather than the first stop almost i feel like it should be people's final stop than first stop yeah because you're not gonna you're not gonna get better for real because you gotta understand like 
honestly, if my, I told you my boss is probably like 29, what I was going to learn from a 29 year old or 27 year old as my boss, I'm 24. He just started too. You didn't, you didn't mm -hmm. experience journalism back in the eighties and nineties when it was at its height. Like he's just saying like, it's certain things where uh, people might over like overlook, like think about like Skip Bayless, how he always talking about past mm -hmm. experience. Like a person like me, I probably wouldn't be able to be on Fox Sports or ESPN yet, even though people think they could do the job. The reason that is because the the past matters. So when you could bring up old stuff and and people be like, then you was there for that, they look at you differently. And and I, I just felt like that that matters. So I, I just feel like the past do matter. And you know you got a lot of history, you gotta get that history. I'm glad you brought that up. And the reason why is because like I'm a huge and so is uh, Duff. He could probably talk to it as well. Like I, I engulf myself almost, it's almost sick how much I love like basketball and WWE, yeah, but but I'm talking about like you know, like real, real time, like live sports. Like it's almost sick how much I love basketball. But the thing that I'm seeing now a lot of the times is when like, you know, you'll have NBA players and it's like as soon as they retire, you know, they get a job as an analyst. Whereas yeah. though, like, and, and, and that kind of bothers me a little bit only because, like, granted, you played the game, you know the game, you've been experienced in the game. But if you look at roads, like, hell, Skip Bayless has been doing this for 50 years. You know, Skip yeah. Bayless don't have no kids because he told his wife, I'm not having no kids so I can do my job. Stephen A was a beat writer for 25 years. So as long as I've been alive, Stephen A was in locker rooms asking questions. You know what I mean? And, and then, like, you have people like Michael Wilbon and all those other people have been doing this for 30, 40 years. You get one guy who played eight seasons in the NBA, and now he's in a suit talking about sports. And for me, for that, for that art, like, because to me, you have my dream job. You know what I mean? Talking about talking about sports and all that type of stuff. But it's just like for those athletes that come out of it, and you know, some of them may be Hall of Famers, some of them may just be average people, and some of them don't need to be talking like Pat Patrick Beverly. It's just more so like, how does that feel? You know, for you, in terms of, you know, having this profession, having this career lineage, almost. Yeah, um, I, I, I like I like that you brought that up. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna be honest with you. A lot of basketball play just because you play the game don't mean you know the game. Like, is like I'm saying, a lot of people was born. I'm gonna say they're born at the time, but you worked hard to play ball. Anthony Edwards even said it. I never watched basketball before. I'm just good at it. Like he he said it. I was old mouse. He's a rookie. He's he's really a good rookie. So you don't guys don't really know basketball. And they always and then the same thing like um, Patrick Bailey, for example. He would he would tell he would say like Stephen A. Smith is being biased towards the, but you be biased towards players too to people that you like so it's like it's still the same thing you're not gonna be like you were so biased versus Chris Paul but then when it came to someone else I forgot who he did somebody I forgot but maybe I don't know it was Draymond it was somebody who he liked or he kind of defended him like yo like come on like you just defended him because you like him and you don't want to get his bass out and the thing. Thing about players talking about sports, I just ignore them. Some people, some players know what they're talking about, but like, come on, it's a reason why Charles Barkley and Shaq and I was on TNT, but Kenny knows basketball, so Kenny holds it down. But those mm -hmm. two is kind of like comedic act activate. So it's like, um, like it kind of it kind of just meshes. Like you, you, you know, Shaq and and Charles, they, they Charles sometimes say some good stuff, but then sometimes be like, come on, Charles. Like, you gotta you, sift through a lot of his bullshit. Yeah, yeah. like you have to. And, and so it's like the players. I always say this, even when I was in high school, because my the best player at my high school, um, he went to go play at St. Joseph's and everything. But I was like, yeah, they don't know basketball. Like I couldn't have an argument with him over basketball because, um, but over the NBA, let me say that over NBA, they could argue about basketball, but they can't argue about NBA. That's totally different conversations, right? There, yeah. Because the NBA. You you really have to watch and understand. It's more than just playing the game. The upstairs part, the VPs. If you you got to understand the chain, and that's why everybody who's like a young journalist or people who want to come in talking about sports in a way or anything is talking about news. I try to explain to them the totem pole of how everything works and how discussions work, and then you can understand like why certain players and um, how certain players are. Um, the GMs, what the GMs do, what's the difference between the GM and the VP of basketball operations? Like you know, it's, it's different. It's different tales and, and the politics are behind it. That's why a lot of these guys don't understand the politics. It's, it's politics, isn't it? <laughs> the two, the two most, the, the two most thing that that runs America is politics, like real politics, Democrat, Republican, and sports. 
those are two things that run America right there. And they they both is hand in hand. A lot of people don't see it or know it because they they think it's different, but it really is. Think about it. The NBA is Democrat, the NFL is Republican. Don't let that go over your heads. The NBA is is, is Democrat and the NFL is Republican. You can see which 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 um teams, why the NFL don't have no black coaches. Like, you know, it's it's stuff like that. You just gotta gotta see, but and understand. And a lot of people know that. A lot of people they won't say it, but they know it. So yeah. I, I guess go ahead, Doug. Oh no, I was definitely agreeing with him, especially on the point like uh like NBA players that just hop right into media, like the new media thing that everybody's talking about now. Like this is this one NBA player that podcast I respect a lot. But he he does it so brilliantly. Is uh JJ Reddick. He has the best podcast yeah. out of all the NBA players. But when it comes to everybody else, because you just like you said, like the NBA is like a system where it's like I like hearing NBA players talk about skills and how they can like get to a basket. I don't care about how they feel about specific teams because you're always yeah. going to have a bias towards them. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. it's never going to be honest. It's never going to be honest commentary coming from an NBA player unless they was like extremely washed and like right, I didn't have no. I was a bench player for thirty years, so I can talk on it. Right, and and that's and that's the thing I want to bring about the politics. It's like just understanding that if you play in the NBA, just know that you got to be kind of on like what Democrat values are. So if you mm-hmm. want to like LeBron James, you want to own a team, don't like you got to be, you can't be like, um, what is it? The abortion stuff. Like, you know, things like that. Yeah. You just, you got to know Mark Jackson. The reason Mark Jackson can't get that coaching guard because you, you didn't you feel type of way about gay people. Now, yeah. now look, you yeah. can't, the NFL, you probably would have got away with that, but you don't, that don't fly in the NBA. And that's why people got to understand the difference in that. You, you, I, I'm, it's a lot of game, man, but um, that's just, that's just something right there where like, things just go with people's heads. But um, yeah. You talked about something that was interesting and I'm, I'm starting to see that almost full circle in terms of everywhere that has some sort of like opinion. Prime example, we're not really going to touch on it, but like stand up comedian jobs are really really at like a tumultuous step because you know you had will smith how he acted in the oscars the grammys whatever the hell it was you know and then now we have kevin durant who is basically like the will smith of the nba you know having one to pick a fight with every single reporter who is just doing their job and their job is to give their opinion over analytics and, and analysis so like when when you as like you know at some point was a reporter as a journalist as a columnist whatever it may be how do you feel about those players like kevin durant russell westbrook who feel like they are kept kyrie Irvin, who don't feel like they owe it to the media to actually answer their questions when in reality they're just doing their job um well um Kevin Durant's situation, um, he 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 kind of being out, outlandish and I like the Kevin Durant back in OKC, you know, before he got cocky with Golden State because um he was he was just an assassin killer. He never talked. I it's like it's like one day he just woke up, turned up, put a Golden State jersey on and say, Yeah, I'm gonna talk. I'm just gonna keep talking. Before he never used to do that. He was really a quiet assassin. So it's crazy to see that, but I mean, I don't, I don't mind it. That's the game, you know. The game, the game is they're gonna act like they don't want you to ins- to say certain stuff. But a lot of these guys, like even six, like you know, this is certain situations when they will come to you and if their management might send you something and say, like it's different. It's different. It's like it's a game, man. They want you to say stuff. Like when Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith said sources and people in KD's camp says something. He really is getting from KD's camp, but KD now got to come out and say, no, that's not true. Da, da, da. He got to combat with it to make it seem real. It's, it's just politics, man. This thing, it goes deep. I'm telling you a lot. These Think about a guy like Stephen A. Smith and Skip a who got connections. So when they say it's, they're not going to, they came from a journalism background. So they're not going to just say something without having a, a fact source to it. So if you're going to come out and say it's not true, like people in the journalism, people like we know it's true because he's not going to just say that. He's not going to say that on TV here. Yeah. Like just like I won't write that in a, a article, but he, but KD has to say has to combat with it and say that we crazy and while well, they crazy and things in that manner because that's just the game. Like you know he can't make it seem too hot. And also on that point though, on KD's side, a lot of people do KD kind of feel. But, but, Betray, like I understand, like 
I have people in the NBA, well, let me not say people, more like on the Sixers side who I trust, who I personally, I won't talk bad about. So, so because I just, again, like you feed me information, I, I thank you, bro. Like, I'm not going to say bad about you. I might, I might attack a teammate, but I'm not going to attack you. And if I always say people, if you read my rights, you can see which players I'm talking about, what, what players who are, who's on my side. But, um, but, uh, but then, but then for like KD example, he probably felt like Stephen A. Smith was on his side. So then when he see that Stephen A. Smith go out, he'd be like, "Yo, bro, what's up with you?" Like, and, and then and then he's probably telling his king, like, "Yo, stop giving him stuff because he's not good no more." So that's so that's how arguments come and be start. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, so. I have to bring it up. You know, you you did work for the Washington Wizards. Now, now, and you did you did do a couple of articles and all that for them. Now, my question was, how, how did you keep that information like fresh and new? You know, especially when a team that really didn't really win much or have a lot of success. Like, like, walk me through that process. Was that hard or? Well, for the Washington Wizards, I never technically had a byline, but they had me as a production assistant. Um, do more like like mass comm work. So you do kind of say the position kind of called like communications coordinator when you like, so it would be a, like a press conference, let's say mm. before you, a pregame and Westbrook would talk. Cause this is when Westbrook was there. So this is when Westbrook or Bill would talk. So I probably had to transcribe what they say and then put it in a different sense, like it, it, things like that. So I never, now I wasn't a byline, but for the wizards it was, they made the playoffs that year. But um, the storyline for them was Russell Westbrook is always a storyline. So, but I didn't take the approach of bashing him. Everybody takes that approach. So when you have certain stars, that's why teams be one stars because that's keep the energy going. So it keeps the reporters writing, the local reporters writing, and it and it keeps the um, the tickets going. And then now, like it's always a storyline. Like teams need a storyline behind them because. No storyline, you won't get on TV. No storyline, you don't get paid ads. And it's just things in that manner. But um, Westbrook's storyline was that they try to make it seem like he was a bad. But Westbrook, Westbrook wasn't bad with the Wizards that year. But he, I watched him practice. Like, when he went to the lake, I told everybody, like, the Lakers wasn't going to make the playoffs. Really? I watched, him, I watched him in practice too much. And he, was, he would miss shots in practice. Like, nobody guarded him. Like that means something. Like you practicing before the game, you backing down. The dude is pushing you, and you missing shots. He missed. And mind you, I work for NBC Sports Washington, so um, the way it works for uh, NBC Sports Washington, they kind of own the Wizards in a way where we can see all their practices. Even though we're not watching Wizards employees, we basically are because I don't know. We get their whole hive, the communications thing. We set up the Zoom. Everything they air in, airs on NBC Sports Network. So. So it was just like a great inside. I like that job because I saw the inside of everything, locker rooms and players, um, so practice. So. Could you go a little bit more into like Russell Westbrook's mannerisms? Because that's going to be the talk of the summer. It's going to be the talk of next year. And hell, it was basically, even during the NBA Finals, you know, there was there was talk of just Russell Westbrook and Anthony Davis. So like, walk me through what you saw before the Lakers got him. He, um... He 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 is a fun guy though. He's he's fun. The, the thing about Westbrook is, um, I think that I think what people don't like about Westbrook, and um, it, it, I understand because not everybody. You guys are from Philadelphia, right? Yeah. See, I'm from Harlem, from Philly. He's from LA. Like you know, our city kids. We have, we grew up differently. We grew up differently. So I understand Westbrook. And I could deal with, like if Westbrook was here with all of us, we could have a conversation where we'd be good. The problem with Westbrook is he has to learn how to turn down that city atmosphere. You know, like we understand what that means, but a lot of other people don't understand that. They don't get it. They're not going to get Westbrook. And it is kind of, it's kind of like dream on a little bit, but it's just that he just need to learn how to turn it, turn it down and when to turn it on and off and how to play the game. The best person at playing the game at turning it on and off is Joel and B. Oh my God. And B behind closed doors, you wouldn't believe it. But in front of the camera, yeah. he's a guy. But the, so Westbrook needs to learn to do that. But Westbrook's going some, I don't care. And that's I try to explain to um other people like my friends stuff when we argue about Westbrook. I'm like, 
the difference between Westbrook and Curry is that Curry grew up middle class, good his whole life. So Curry, in his mind, feel like, yo, I had to be great and go further than just this. Westbrook don't feel that way because he felt like, yo, me just being here is good. Mm -hmm. I made it already. Yeah, hardest mindset. I made it like me just being here is good. Like I don't think like and I used to have an argument. I always put Iverson in my top ten um, best basketball players, not NBA, but best basketball players, because of he does. He's another player people don't understand because he wasn't supposed to be there. People don't remember he got arrested at the bowling alley back in high school. Mm-hmm. No team, no college wanted him. Everybody forget he had to do two years in Georgetown. Only Coach Thompson picked him up. He, he entered the NBA at 21 years old. Everybody else, Kobe and him, Garnett, they just went at 17. So people thought he got washed. But you got to say he came at 21 already. So yeah. if you really do the math, 06, that's nine years. But if he would have came a little earlier, he would have lasted to 2012, 2010. But he, it didn't happen because he came no. already old enough. And, and a lot of people don't understand Iverson because Iverson mindset was like, damn, why everybody – I mean, he don't all well, I know is Virginia. Why everybody is so mad? Why all the media keep so mad about how I dress? Why the media so mad about how I talk? Why the media so mad about I, why I say this? Like I'm just a kid making it. I'm just glad to be making millions of dollars right now. His mom kissing like no, you t- he he thinks in Ives' mind, yo, me taking care of my mom, my mom's good, my family's good. That's the best thing in the world. But the NBA and you know the people who wasn't born that same way look at it. Oh yeah. no, you you a great player, you average 30 points. Why are you not a winner? Like he's not looking at it like that. Yes, <laughs> tell the two stories. Not, yeah, I was having that conversation with uh, with some with some folks uh, in like Twitter space. I was I was going off, and I thought like that's a great space where you want to just like get your rocks off and just want to just be a little arrogant about what you know or whatever yeah. like that. I love I love going in there and dropping gems. But one thing one thing that I said that was really important was just like not everybody to your point, Doc. Not everybody in the NBA wants to win a championship. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Like prime example, like Melo could have had a chance in 2014, 15, one of those years, Houston, Chicago, Miami prior. It's like, no, nah, I'm gonna sign this deal for 130 million and I'll never have to worry about money again. And I, even though I may not win shit, that's why now you see he's chasing the ring at like a million years old, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can't move his feet past a brick of lettuce. You know what I mean? So like those it's type of things. because they finally mature at that age though. By the time they get old and they can't play, they probably be like, damn, now I understand what people was talking about. They understand too late. And then that it's kind of like a rapper's mindset where it's like, yo, you made so much money early on and now you mature now. You you did you you you, you did every girl already. <laughs> you made the most money you could already. Now it's like then you got kids like I ain't gonna lie, yeah, I'm mature now. Like, but now it's over. <laughs> it's not yeah. the same no more. You can't no. you can't chase the same accolades that you once had the yeah. chance to chase. Yeah. That's what Westbrook is doing. That's why I said I always told people Westbrook is not gonna do because now Westbrook went that ring and want to be home, but it's not gonna work that way because now you're not the same Westbrook. No. And, mm-hmm. and you no. now you mad because and what made it even worse, you in LA. Like if you would have been somewhere else. It have been different. Now you know, LA. That it's like being in New York. That camera time different. You, yeah. that time, you, you, he wants to be the star of the team. So if he if he would have stayed back and not want to be the star so much and changed his game, then maybe. But that's not Westbrook. If Russell Westbrook had a jump shot, he'd be a million times better. But you know, it's just like yeah. just, just, just. There's so many. There's so many forced issues with like the whole West, the whole Russell Westbrook product. You know what I mean? Because when, when I when I heard. That that the Sixers, I'm just kidding, not Sixers, the Lakers getting Russell Westbrook. In my mind, I was like, why? You know, because anybody anybody that has watched basketball or even been in the realm of basketball, they see those triple doubles. But if you actually watched those Thunder games and you watched those Wizards games and you watched how some of those offensive schemes were t- were tailored to get those triple doubles, I'm sitting back. I'm like, how the hell is a guy that playing with LeBron James who thrives? with you know corner shooters and some you know jack of all trades shooting guard is gonna work with Russell Westbrook. I said there's no way in hell. You want a championship with Dwayne Wade, you want a championship with Kyrie Irving. Russell Westbrook is in no same stratosphere as those two folks, even though personally yeah. I don't really like Kyrie Irving, but you can't get that done. Yeah, yeah, it's going yeah, it's too tough. But it, it, LeBron and LeBron is not always 
I don't know. You got LeBron. LeBron's not really the same either as no. he, he can't carry a team the same way he did. Um, so he needs help. So that's why, too. That's the number yeah. one. I want to I wanna get on the fact because today is Father's Day. Today is definitely Father's Day. And there's a lot of things going on right now. We got Father's Day and Juneteenth all in the same, like, stratosphere. And I, want, I wanted to ask you, too, you know, how do you feel about Father's Day? Because I'm driving. I drove to the mall before before this episode. I don't see no Happy Father's Day shit. I don't see no nothing. I don't see no, not a damn thing. But Lord God, when, when when it's Mother's Day, you know there's flowers, there's teddy bears, there's this, there's that, there's this, there's that. I don't see anything. Like I don't know if, if you're a father, Doc. I'm not a father. I know Duff's not a father that we don't know of yet. You know, he, okay. he, there's, a lot, there's, there's a lot of women that love him. But um, but talk to me a little bit about that. Like, why is there so less love? Fathers, yeah, I'm not a father, and um, <laughs> I just I'm just not, not that gonna... you know of. <laughs> oh, yeah, not that we know of, we don't know, man. Little docs running around. <laughs> I hope not, man. That's <laughs> not a but um, the it's crazy. Um, I'll keep having CMUs, it's it's interesting, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just interesting. Um, I mean, like he said, sometimes being a, that's why being a man is just being a man is hard, and um, you're never going to get the praise the same as you would because everybody expects you. Like nobody thinks that men really got feelings or yeah. like they they use women. From it's people use. Um, that conflict between men and women equal and stuff like that when it's beneficial, you know, it's not be- when it's not beneficial that conflict go out the door, like you know, a conflict go out the door. When I, like Father's Day, for example, is a national holiday, and for for since I've been alive, I never seen it ever like a big holiday. Like yeah. it's not really a big holiday. You know, you might get a little coffee mug and things like that, but why I don't see like girls like Ari and stuff flying out her baby daddy or I don't know, treating her baby daddy, flying them out. Oh, happy Father's Day, you're a good father. I don't know. They, they I see Ariana get these big trucks, Jada you know, get these big trucks, but when it comes to their baby daddies and they boyfriends or whatever you want to call their husbands, how come they don't get the same treatment? Why they don't get like the biggest scrap? Like girls, they, they, they do like a little fake stuff, give them probably a lot of flowers or you know, they send them, they don't do nothing big like the men do. Men got to go all out for their girl. But when it comes to girls, girls don't go, go all the way out because we take it. Uh, if a girl if a girl decides to take it out to dinner, we be like, man, she took me out to dinner. I I, I like her. But that's nothing, though. We mm-hmm. do that all the time for girls. We do that for on first date. But when a girl does that to us, we got to be like, man, she did that? It's just a surprise because we know girls is not really built like that. So it really comes from just women, women. And women's more sentimental than than men. So a one like even when I like me having a girlfriend and stuff, I've realized like I will probably buy her a Louis bag, but she'll probably for my birthday, she'll probably do more something more sentimental by having a keychain with a heart of us in the thing that might cost fifty dollars, but it's sentimental, so it means a lot. Like, you know, that's that's the different mindsets men and women have. So that's basically why I th- I feel like Father's Day is not as same thing because men go harder for women in terms of money wise. While girls rather do more sentimental stuff, probably in house at home, not really like a big outside thing. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, I feel like well, as men in that aspect, as uh, like parental is underappreciated because when it's Mother's Day, you know your woman. I'm not, I don't have a child, but your woman is gonna be like she's gonna drag you on like yo, you I need something, or it's gonna pound in her head from social media. Yo, X Y Z did this for X Y Z. Why can't I get with the treatment that they're getting? And it's like men. I know I, if I see something, I'm like yo, why did you know it's reverse i never ask nobody hey uh can i get something for xyz my birthday i don't really care so i feel like we don't really care about it but it'd be nice sometimes to receive gifts man for doing what we're supposed to do i say that get out of jail free card is uh, that that's that's that sentimental shit is a get out of jail free card you know yeah. what i mean because at, at the end at the end of the day you know we as men, and, and this we me and Duff have talked about this on many, 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 many episodes. It's just like there is nothing more important than actually having 
a male in the household. You know, there is nothing more important than having your, I will die on that hill. There is nothing more important than having your father in that household. And I mean, a lot of us didn't have that, you know what I'm saying, growing up. And like, you know, sometimes that works very well. You know, you overcome, you supersede. Sometimes it does not. And we have seen a lot of times where it does not. And it's just like, because of all of that, a lot of times comes from just not having a father, not having your dad or a father figure in the household. So on a day such as Father's Day, (laughs) a little bit more than a stupid ass tie or a coffee mug from the dollar store would be appreciated. (laughs) You know, because a lot of times, like a lot of these houses are the houses and households that men build. You know what I'm saying? I'm not taking that credit away from women, but long and behold, when there's a man in the household, that is that man's household (laughs) at the end of the day. But we're always taught to, you know, be behind, be the background, be the backbone. Well, you can't walk without a backbone. (laughs) So (laughs) it, 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 it it starts to like almost like circumvent, you know, in, in our lives. And everybody says, oh, I don't need a dad. I don't need a man. Yes, you do. Regardless of whatever you may think, and, yes, and you another, do. Another sad thing, you know, um, a lot of men. Some, on the other hand, men do need to step up and want to be fathers. Though um, I be seeing way too many mothers have, like recently, like our generation from ages. I'm gonna say our generation more like it was born in '96, but mm-hmm. '96 to like maybe like '90, '89, but. But I, I want to count the young generation too in our generation. Since we all in this space, we still see them. Like even though I'm 27, um, I, the 20, the 22 year olds, they kind of and it's kind of weird now because of how Instagram and, and everything is set up. So we all kind of in the same generation, even though we technically not. They be having it's be too many baby mothers going having baby showers. Their baby daddies don't be there. Like not every, there. I Bro, I've there. never seen one. I, like it's like out of ten, I'll probably see like two with. Yeah, uh, that's a, it. A, a I did ten. I've seen one and a half. What? Yeah, like he <laughs> nah, barely maybe there. Half, maybe half. Yo, it's so it's rare. It's so rare. You so. And yeah. I'm talking about. And we want to go far from the last two years, from 2020 to 2022, because 2020 had all those pandemic babies coming. But from from that time, from those two years, I don't. You know, it I, from New York, Philly, and Delaware. That's like where most of my followers is from in DC, the DMV area. I probably, I don't like uh, 40, 40 to 50, and probably three of them had daddies. Yeah. And, or if they didn't have a daddy, the daddy probably came later and probably felt bad and, and finally took a picture with them at their first birthday when they maybe turned one. So it was stuff like that. But they, it be, it's bad out here in the street. And also, women got to stop having um, babies with people that's not your boyfriends, too. I thought, yeah. like, I was a yes. girl. I was a girl. I'm not gonna tell. I hate hate having this conversation with um with girls, but I'm gonna be like, yo, I, uh, every man gonna want to go raw probably or want to go and do it because it's just like if they not getting the right feeling, you know, men men dumb, we dumb, but it's your you're the one that gotta hold a baby for now. If I have to hold a baby for nine months, I'm being super protective. I swear to God, I, if I don't want a baby, I'm being super protective because carrying a baby for nine months is different than a man just. Doing it, he's not really thinking about it because he's like, maybe she'll get it to take the pill, or maybe she's not gonna keep it, or he, like he's not really thinking about because he don't want to carry a baby for nine months. You do not at all. So your mindset gotta be, oh, I gotta protect myself better. Woman gotta protect themselves better too. It goes hand in hand. You can't, you could blame men for 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 going in. It takes two, but at the end of the day, it's still it goes. It's on you. It's really. It's hey. on you. What me, me and Duff had this conversation privately, but like, you know, what, what I always say is that if there was, and if there was a man in that, in that scenario, like a father figure and allowed that to happen, shame on him, shame on him, not happy father did to him. But if there was a father present in that scenario, eight out of those 10 babies would not have been, that would not have happened. Not saying they wouldn't be born, but I'm saying that scenario in itself probably would not have happened because I, I like to say this a lot of times we see a lot in our in our culture for some reason that it's usually prime and then a baby shower there is no expectation to get married there's a lot of there's a lot of lack in terms of hey 
I want a life partner. You don't have to be married. You want a life partner. Life partner. You know yeah, I mean? it's not that. It's just like a one night stand type of situation. Yeah, and, and it's like happen. But it, exactly. It, but people say mistakes happen. But it's like at the end of the day, you that's a you can prevent that mistake from happening. All all you have to do is practice safe sex, literally. So I don't understand when people say, "Yo, mistakes happen sometimes." No, if you in the moment and you. If you're really consciously thinking, which I know most of us men aren't in that in that no. moment, then no. but so the mistake is on you. But it's, it's both, like he said, it's both parties, in my opinion, because like she can just tell him you'll wrap it up, or he can be and, like, you know what, I'm about to wrap it up, and then guess what? No baby, no STDs, no uncurables, and that's just what it is. And it's, it's crazy to, to Duff's point, you know, and we, we again we've talked about this, but I it's almost it's almost strange to me. Because I, a lot of times, and I know sometimes they don't like to hear this, but I ask the question anyway. You, you either not answer it or you don't. I always ask, did you want him to be the father of your child? And then a lot of them, they'd be like, well, no, but this is just what it is. And I'm like, I'm not taking care of something because that's just what it is. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, as, as a human, like, you shouldn't want to have to burden yourself with just it is what it is. It's not always it is what it is, especially when you allowed you know, that to happen. There was not one quality that you saw in that guy that said, you know what? I want him to be the father. And black women do need a, um, like when you have a baby like that, it's, it's, it's apps called Tinder and Hinge. I be seeing my friends be writing in the group chat. Bro, it's, it be some girls that's just ridiculous. You just had a baby and now you on Hinge. Like you literally have your baby is five days old, a month old. Like girl, you have to now find yourself now like you have a baby don't why are you looking for a new man like no guy our age is going to take care of that baby i don't care how you are i don't care how bad you think you look i don't care how big your thing is listen you're no man going like you have to find yourself he might you might find someone later once they but you gotta get now you gotta become on your stuff like because if your if your baby dad's not gonna be there for you and you rely on his child support when technically he probably don't work most because a lot of people, men, black men who who do this don't really work. So they probably do other stuff. They work a different way than what we what we do. So they you're not getting that much money off that um, child support. So now you gotta work. So now, but with men, and this is another thing. A lot of I just the only thing I probably disagree with Kevin Samuels where he said that um, men don't really care about women's money. All right, it, it, it's true to that, but. I I do want my girl and wife to to be somebody like yeah I don't want yes. you to be like a Ariana or like I want you to be somebody like oh what do you do oh she oh I'm a lawyer out of here like all right I might pay all the bills but she, at least she's a lawyer like if I feel comfortable that she's not living off me like like I know it's just the mindset like I don't want my girl to feel like she's that I'm, I'm taking like I'm her father now like I you want to be like a mutual thing. Doc, that's an interesting point you brought up. And, you know, it's a difficult conversation to have because a lot of times, like, the women we end up marrying or the women we end up having kids with do not <laughs> look like any of those chicks on Instagram no, at all. Yeah. Because, like, I don't know about you, Doc, but I know me and Duff have both had these scenarios separately. Those women that look like that are almost intolerable. Like, I cannot be in a room with, you know, a woman that looks like that longer than 15 minutes done it been there done that and i'm like yo you are stupid and i don't i don't use that word a lot i don't i don't like to call people stupid but there are some times when i'm sitting there where it's just everything is what you see yeah that's it i can't i can't i can't i can't rock off what you see i i really at that i'm at that age where it's like that shit was cool when i'm in college but now if you can't talk to me longer than 15 minutes without giving me TikTok headlines I'm not interested. Yeah, that, that's, that's just me. Too. That's annoying too when, when when people talk in Instagram and TikTok turn. But that 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 though, and I, I met some some girls who's who talk like that, and they're not necessarily like like girls like Ari and I keep using Ari because that's like the main figure. Like she's like the top one girl in that thing. So that's why I keep using Ari. But it's other. It's a lot of other girls like industry wise. But um, I met. Our generation is messed up a little bit. I think we might we're gonna have marriage for black people is gonna be even going lower because a lot of men are not gonna be able to tolerate it's, it's not gonna be worth it. Because you know why it's not gonna be worth it? We look at it like this. Why am I paying for everything 
for you. And I can't even really trust that you're not going to cheat on me because you go outside so much. You still go outside, even if you want to keep your girl in the house. All right, cool. I don't even know. I really like you. Like, like I feel like it's not a fair deal sometimes when the man got to pay for everything and you don't do nothing. And it's like, yo, what's the fair deal? And this is the case. I'm also just live by myself. Right. I'll probably have more food in the you can't cook. These girls can't even cook. That's the other thing. No. Cooking better than girls. Like it really embarrassing. Like I'd be cooking better than some girls. Like the, the things they can make, they love making shrimp alfredo. You could go on YouTube and, and how to make shrimp alfredo. That's the only thing girls know how to make is shrimp alfredo. I swear to God, that's the number one thing girls make in our age group. Shrimp alfredo. My mother was could cook. My grandma could cook. So I'm used to certain meals, and you can't make like those meals. It's just like, what's the point? I'm also be single, do what I do. And I, I, you save a lot of money not even having a girlfriend these days because they all they yes. do, all they do is, is go to Justin LaBoy page and be like, hey, if your man not doing this, everybody want to be treated like little baby girlfriend. You're, first of all, I'm not little baby, one. Two, that's a fantasy. That's not real life. Three, his money, I ain't gonna lie, that man makes a million, million, million dollars for now. But we'll see how it goes in the future. But I'm not that. And most Americans aren't like that. So you got to get off the yeah. Instagram. And it's really yeah. annoying. It's kind of annoying to date today. That's that's my number one thing that I hate now is like people have those Instagram expectations because they see it off of Instagram and they like, yeah, like I just previously said, they see the fantasy that's portrayed on Instagram and they try to emulate that to real life. And you're not going to get that because one, I don't have a million dollars constantly coming into the bank. I can't give you what you want now. And I'm a broke ass nigga to you. Like that don't make sense. I can't provide. How can I provide because I bought you a Gucci bag? That don't make sense. Now, they say, they say, they, they're going to say that you broke because you can't yeah. do it, right? But then they're going to find... This the mindset, though. This is the mindset that girls do today. They're going to call bro because you can't do it, right? They're going to find a scammer. The scammer who's who been rich for, for, for two months now. And now you with him for two months and now his piece is not hitting the same. Everything's not coming the same. Now he go through a five-month drought. And mind you, these kids that be scammers and stuff the regular dudes, we're not talking about the rapper people that we know famous. Mm. We're talking about the local skin because these girls can't reach little baby. So they go after the guys who look like little baby. Yeah. Technically. Like technically, when you go to my Instagram, some people would say I'm flashy, but I feel like that's more like a New York thing for me. But mm -hmm. we're talking about guys who's willing to get these renties and get Rolls Royces every weekend, right? That's so temporary because they don't have a crib. They don't have, they never had their own crib. No right. money in the bank. They don't have no money in the bank. So you make all this money. You, <laughs> about, you, about you made 100K. You made 100K. You made 100K during the pandemic. Cool. During all those Santana scams. You made you made all that money in those four months with nothing to show for it. You don't own nothing. So now you with him. You be like, damn, he don't even get that much money. You with him for five months. You've been giving you crying. But you love him now because, you know, girls get emotional now. Another thing about girls is. Yeah, they might talk to you for the money, but once they with you, you keep dealing with them. It turns mm -hmm. into more emotion. You know? So now they're like, man, he broke now, but now it's like, I love him and I can't get, can they get too attached? Like, that's why Young Miami, all those songs they play is nonsense because girls are still emotional creatures. These girls, the money only lasts so long until they get that emotional. And after a month, a girl start loving you. What's a girl love you? It's a rap. It don't matter how much money you got. She going to love you for you. She don't love you for the money. That's why it's so let me tell you something. I had I had somebody before my situation now. I had somebody come to me when I was 24. I'm about to be 25 next month. So I'm I'm counting myself as 25, but like early 24. I had somebody, a woman who had no job, no car, couldn't cook, came to me and told me that a hundred K a year ain't enough. I said, Well, what you got? I said, a hundred K a year ain't enough. Enough for who? Like <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it's it's these lives that they live, like and 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 it, and it kills me. You know, my my whole thing was when I wanted to find a woman that I could be with was that they could not be engulfed in like social media. Social like they media. had to have yeah. a turn it off button because I promise you that <laughs> the way I live. <laughs> granted, I've been fortunate enough to have education, have a master's degree, have good money, make good money, have my own shit. Me and Dove, obviously, we talk about it. We own our own business. I don't live like those people, and I don't aspire to live like, even if I had a million-dollar salary, I still wouldn't live like those people because you're paying. I was just at the mall today, 
and I was looking at, you know, uh, an anniversary gift, you know, from my partner. And I went to these bag stores. I'm like, yo, this bag looks fucking terrible. Like, even the gold chain looks gold plated. And the bag was $2,900. I said, like, yo, this bag looks terrible. But because it's a little piece of fucking plastic on it that says YSL, I'm like, yo, this shit is horrible. But that's what they like. And I'm just like, whatever. Yeah, that's a fact, man. That's crazy. Yeah, but Doc, I wanted I wanted to uh, get into some stuff that you do because you know what I'm seeing is you were doing a lot of sports stuff, and now more so a lot of the work that I've been reading and correct me if I'm wrong has been like you know a lot of criminal justice work, like reporting about like you know a lot of violence in Philadelphia. Can you can you walk me through how you see Philadelphia like right now? Um, but the reason that's what it is. My my goal is to just be strictly sports, but sometimes um this industry the sports thing might not come and sometimes the money don't match up to what the role is so mm. for me like i always tell people like you got to be diverse even though i want to do sports the news thing and politics and writing about crime and things like so phl i do everything i write about whatever i write about crime sports um the local Museum, Juneteenth, rip, reparations, anything, um, governor stuff. So I could write about anything. I have control over it like that. But um, the reason I do local crime is because we still a news station at the end of the day. We're not a sports station. We're a news station. So I still got to do that news. So um, so even though I do Philadelphia writing, it's Philadelphia Eagles, Sixers, and Phillies, I also got to do the crime. But crime in Philadelphia, it really shocked me because I mean, I, I'm from Harlem and <laughs> being from New York, we we have crime, but they ain't slowed down in New York. And I always yes. say, I always say, um, people think crime in New York is so bad. I'd be like, listen, stop going off of. I'm like, if you on Instagram all day and you see the headlines, okay, cool. But the problem is with that, you gotta look at the numbers because the difference is, okay, New York have 485 homicides. That's not a lot. Like, that's from 2021. That's not necessarily a lot for how big New York City yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, people people don't understand. Yeah, like, yeah, people don't understand that, yeah. Bro, New York City is humongous. So people think it's so bad because of the drill music. But it's not like, I'd be like, yo, listen, you could walk safe in New York. It's, that's why you think, I'd be like, why you think there's so many um, ca Caucasians in, in, in Harlem and identify like that because it's not that bad as people think it is. Now, Philly is different. Philly was different because then I'm like, I'm doing crime. And then the it's like, when I look at the Philly numbers, it's like 2 million, 3 million people in the city. But the problem with the the city is in the Philly, the, this, the, the way how it's set up, like the infrastructure, it's different between like black people and white people. So like you could kind of get a feel when something happens, Oh, it's, it's probably was black, and when something happened here, it probably was white. And the infrastructure, way how it's set, how that's just one I ninety five highway going through. See, New York is not like that. Where it's so many different parts, and Philly is here, 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 neighborhood, neighborhood, neighborhood. And then you have five hundred and I think it was five sixty or five eighty homicides in a year, and that broke the record. And then when you also think about it, it's the way how Philly is. See, New York got a lot of gangs. Philly don't necessarily have gangs. So the scary part about Philadelphia shootings and homicides was it could be a random person, a random day. I could be at the gas station getting gas. I'm licensed to carry a gun. I'm not licensed to carry a gun. I'm just saying. But the person could be licensed to carry a gun, and they try to protect themselves. And they just shoot a man in the head. And that counts as a homicide. But I'm a normal civilian. But it's him getting robbed by somebody with a ski mask or just getting robbed. He got to protect himself. So it's so many crimes like that. Then it's just so many, like, also the robberies. It's just so it's just so much crime going on. It's not only the shooting. It's just robberies. It's carjackings. Oh, my God. Carjackings. It's the kids' fights. And then you keep seeing trauma like 14-year-old dad, 12-year-old dad, 13-year-old Caucasian boy shot the police and police shot back and shot him. Like those stories right there, you don't see that everywhere. And I always say Philadelphia is more dangerous than Chicago because Chicago, Chicago's um, beefs only happen in like a section. Perception, so everything yeah. is in the section in Chicago. Like this is, and I always say New York crime was, was 
back in the 90s was insane because it happened in every borough. It didn't matter. Italians, mob was going crazy. The the drug game. New York had 2,000 murders back then. See, that's crazy. 2,000 homicides is ridiculous. That's but, ridiculous. Uh, but now Philadelphia thing is you could have a shooting in Center City. And that considered in Center City is considered downtown. So it, it's just crazy, man. I'm going to give you some uh, statistics real quick. So in Philadelphia in last year, we eclipsed over 2,600 shootings. Just 2,600 shootings in the city. We eclipsed over 550 homicides. We haven't had that number since 1960. That record was held since 1960. And on top of that, that number is up 70% because of armed robbery. And you know, I go to I go to New York at least once every other month, and that's why like, I love I love the fact that you're like from Harlem because when I go to New York, I go to Harlem. I'm right at one two fifth, but now I'm more down. I'm down like one seventeenth now because my homie just moved. So like I'm I'm always I'm always in Harlem, and I, and I love it. And it's crazy when I look at it because like when I first started going to New York, I used to be like, damn, like you know, like this it's New York City. But now it's like, yo, bro, Harlem's almost more safe to walk around. In my own neighborhood, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's crazy. good vibes. It's, it's good vibes. Like so, I was in this group. I'm still in the group, but we different now. Um, a little falling out, but it was in group called Most Love. He used to throw cookouts. We was like a big thing in Harlem. Like Harlem was known for, like we had cookouts and stuff. Like we get get light, get dance. Like Harlem, even me growing up was never technically bad. And the Bronx was bad. I can always tell. I'm not, I'll tell you a story. We we do another interview one day. I get like growing up in New York, how it was. I I I try, I try to lay it out for everybody from each year time zone, the music wise, what what changed, what didn't change, how Cameron and stuff. Like it's a lot of stories of Harlem people don't know unless you're really from Harlem and you know people like my like Big L was my basically my uncle, but he passed away. So really, but Big L was your uncle. Yeah, if you go on my well, big, like we don't. Like, how can I say this? Like, if he was alive, like when he was alive, I was calling him uncle. Turns out that um, it's just that my cousin, so my father, they were by marriage. So we all by marriage. So, but he's from 141st. I'm from mm -hmm. 139th. But our families had got together, basically. So there's a all, mural of him right by the liquor store. I forgot what street it's on, but there's a nice mural of him, like right next to the liquor store. Like, we yeah, that's, on the block, that's on the block I'm from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's 40th, I'm from 139th. Mm -hmm. If you go on my Instagram, it's, it's a picture of me with Big L. I was three years old. Yeah, I was just listening. He's, he, I, I like Big L, man, because he had a couple of songs that I really like. Like, Ebonics one of my shits, man. I'm for real. Yeah, all my family's in that video. But um, but I'm trying, what I'm trying to explain is um, there's just certain things that happened in New York growing up. I, I like to lay it out. But um, but yeah, it's just different in the city and cities. And I understand. And I understand. So Philadelphia City was so crazy because the gang violence... It's no gangs. Like I, I don't see the gangs. I see rap beefs though. I see I see the rap beefs, don't get me wrong. But that's different than actually being blood or crip or being YG and being folk. Like we understand it. I didn't understand I don't understand the crime sometimes because it didn't and the way it just be so easy the way how Philadelphia buildings are set up. Cause y'all got like houses and New York is not houses. We got like big buildings. And if you want to go kill somebody, so you gotta go into the projects. Pro you gotta do too much in Philly. And you go outside on your stoop, somebody just come by and it's just it's just easy. So it's just Philly's a danger zone, man. And I don't I don't go outside like that in Philly. I'd be cautious. So Harlem's not like that, or Harlem's good vibe. The Bronx, uh, <laughs> he's a uh, Brooklyn, you good in Brooklyn. Like it's Brooklyn's so big, you good. Like I'm saying some places in the Bronx, you are good though, but you you do gotta be cautious. But 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 it, the Bronx is basically like the whole Philadelphia. Like why, like that type of why? So that's why the crime. I feel like Philadelphia should be. I feel like Philadelphia should be a city where Biden should look at. You from Delaware? I feel like like it or Will Smith and Kevin Hart. I see Kevin Hart got memorial faces on um, blocks and stuff. I'd be like, yo, I never heard your voice though. Like I always be like, I always say, you. He probably has low key establishment somewhere doing stuff. Everybody do. But that does. But where's your voice? That you're not speaking up, like you're not doing nothing. Like we got, we got to see you in the field. Today is Juneteenth. You should have been in the field today. Like those things matter, and they don't. Like Will Smith, you made a career off of saying Philadelphia, West Philadelphia. You posted, you made another show called um, Bel Air. Why are you? Not, worried about slapping niggas. 
Yeah, you you him you like you supposed to be in your city. Your city is, is right now to me it should be even though Chicago might be still the murder capital, but I feel like this should really be the murder capital. Like it needs to stop. I agree. I agree. And now there has been rumors, and I definitely want uh, you know you and Dub's opinion on this. There has been rumors that you know Pennsylvania itself is completely night and day to um to Philadelphia. You know, like like Pennsylvania, it, it, it's heavy, heavy farmland, heavy, you know, former like factory yeah. shit or whatever. So a lot of, and a lot and really spread out. But a lot of the what's going on in Philadelphia is the complete opposite. Everybody's real condensed. There's a lot of gun. There's a lot of gun violence. And that's because of how loose like Pennsylvania's gun laws are because of how the rest of the state looks. Pennsylvania is a huge state. Believe it or not, and you know a lot. What's going on now in the city is that you know there's rumors. Not saying they're true yet, but there's rumors going around that the, the state of Pennsylvania may actually allow Philadelphia to change its gun laws based off of the violence that's in the city. Do you feel like that would be like a positive or a negative? Just talk, both of y'all. Just talk to me. Like talk me through that process. What do you think? Go ahead, Duff. Oh, okay. not, whatever. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I don't. Uh, I, I guess it would be a positive. I mean, there's already guns that circulated throughout the city, so I guess you just got to sweep now. But besides that, it's really not going to help nothing, in my opinion. It, it needs more law enforcement. They need to crack down on what's happening. Really get into what's really happening. And uh, yeah, they're just letting people kill them, kill each other now. That's all they're doing now. They're not really solving any cases or nothing. People just like oh, he's he's dead. That's another number on the board. So that's how I feel about it. I feel like they're not really doing their job. And if you go on the city website, you can actually apply to be a police officer. So you know that they're uh short staff with police. They need uh, more law enforcement. Better uh, laws though. Outlaw, um, Commissioner Outlaw, she said it. She said it um multiple times on our station that they short staff and uh they even allowing um hopefully this word get out more I've been been saying that they allowing people from different states. So you don't gotta live in Philadelphia or there's Pennsylvania. You could live in New York and apply for Philadelphia and you don't need residency. And you could be a police officer in Philly. But the problem with the police officer thing, um, I got to answer the other question. Police, people that wanna be law enforcement is looking at it like, yo, why would I be a police officer in Philadelphia when I can make the same money being a, a state trooper? They don't have to deal with this ridiculous crime. So they look like I might as well take the easy way out. Like I don't have to, I'm not being in a field in the city. I could just go to the PA and, and it makes sense because most of people who work in Philadelphia don't live in Philadelphia. A lot of people live on the outskirts. And I and I learned that way. It's like people rather live in Chester or Delco. I don't think Delco's kind of on this Philadelphia, right? Yeah. People, but those are right next to Philadelphia, but people don't live in Philly. They they rather live on the outskirts. So when you live on the outskirts, police officers look like, yo, I could just live on the outskirts, Philadelphia right there. If I want to get some good food, probably drive 15 minutes there, but I could work in this district. Like, you know, people, like I don't live in Philadelphia. I live in Wilmington. People told me Wilmington was bad. I, I don't see it. But um, I but um, yeah, I'm I, I don't live there. A lot of my coworkers don't live in Philly. Only like two people probably live in Philly and ain't thinking about moving now. And a lot of people who was born and raised in Philadelphia even moving out of Philly. A lot of people was moving to Atlanta. I was that was weird. I was like Atlanta, but a lot of people moved to Atlanta outskirts of Philadelphia, outside of like in Pennsylvania, like a little more uptown, uptown ish. So a lot of people don't live there. So that's I think that's the reason why the police officer thing. But about the guns, I'm gonna be quick and then um, let you go. Um, I feel like what they need to do. You gotta do what New York did. You gotta get stop and frisk, and you get more. Wow. In, yeah, you gotta get stop and frisk, and you gotta just do what Bloomberg did. Bloomberg changed New York City for the good. The reason for that, it might come off as racist, and it, and it did. But the difference between now and then is that police officers now know that you can't do that. Keep doing that racist stuff. You feel me? Like you can't. Like it's not you're not gonna be able to get away with it as you did back then, shall I say? Like, come on, that was the early 2000s. Now, as of today, if you bring my stuff in frisk, it won't really look like how it looked back then because people got their camera phones. They're gonna be waiting for you to do something that's that's um that's like racist or whatever or 
or like you're just being racist. But it, I don't feel like it's going to be that bad. That's why you need stuff on first because these guys are just carrying guns. And you gotta get the guns off. So stop and frisk. And like Bloomberg did, if you got a gun, five years each bullet a year. If you do that, I'm telling your city will change. Bloomberg did it. He changed New York City. New York City was horrible in the 90s. Literally in 2000, you could see the difference. It's, it's YouTube videos. Look at the transition from New York City, how downtown used to look all throughout the years. And then you changed into the early 2000s. You look at it, like, damn, New York City did a complete 360. Gentrification really started the late 90s, but really to early 2000s in Harlem. But it just started changing, and he did it. So, And I don't like gentrification, but the problem with that, that's on us now. We got to buy blocks back. That has nothing to do with all the other politics stuff. Gentrification is more on Black people not knowing, oh, stop selling your homes and then leaving and think you got a good deal. No, you would have kept your home. Like, you know, that's more of a black person thing. That's not really, you know what I mean? We let white people in Conda in a way. Like, you know, things was changing, but your rent didn't necessarily go up because we owned it. You own it. So if you own it, it don't really go up. That's, that's another misleading thing. No matter how many buildings they, they built, as apartment buildings, that's cool. They built it, but um, that's us. That's our fault because we never bought it. Like it, things don't things wasn't always apartments. They was more like uh, I think it's called condos, and you could actually buy it and own it, own your condo in the apartment. Like my mother did that, and a lot of people didn't buy. It. They wanted to just leave it and let the wipers come in and buy it. So yeah, do, do the research. A lot of times in Philadelphia, what we see, especially I'm going to say more so with business owners, is a lot of times that the people who operate the business don't own the building. You know, so yeah. so you know, and and the building is either owned by an individual or type of person, you know, that's not African-American and doesn't live in the neighborhood, you know, so they could, they could give two shits less about like what happens to the neighborhood. Cause they just own the building in the neighborhood. There's no, there's no reinvestment, you know, and, and that's, and that's the, a lot of the problems. Like what, well, we could talk about this all day, but in, in terms of, you know, the violence in terms of the reinvestment and the terms of actually understanding like the total, like cultural makeup, of, of Philadelphia is 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 a task that not a lot of people feel like doing. So, um, stop and frisk is is definitely something that that's interesting. You know, it's it's, it's interesting because I don't know if that because the way city council works in Philadelphia, that it's it's like ninety percent black, like ninety or eighty seven percent black. So I don't know if that would be perceived well by them. But I mean, it would. That's definitely a quick fix to you know what would what would go on. You know, you wouldn't see a lot of the crime, but stop and frisk in Philadelphia would, would be ridiculous. Like I, I, that would definitely move a lot. It, it would it, change it, overnight. It, 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 would change, it would change the city overnight. And the only, the main problem we have in today's society, right, when it comes to police officers versus um, pedestrians and black people, right? So I can see you and I know that like you like me and Duff, I see that you like me, like we are, we are black, but, but we're like you know, we probably was raised in the hood, but we have like a sense of mind. We know the difference between us and somebody probably like, I, Meek Mill is different, but I'm gonna say Meek Mill when he first started up, right? We know the difference, but they can't see the difference. No. They can see black, so that's the that's another problem. Is like, I, I could tell when a dude is gangster or tough or he's up to no good. And I can also tell when a black person is just, he's a civilian black person, but they can't, they can't tell the difference between- They the just two. see black. So they just see that's the problem. So that's and that's a society thing when it comes to white people and and I, and it's just, they have a a mindset. They think that oh you gotta wear a suit for me to know that you're not a bad apple. And that's not necessary. That's bull crap. That, that's the problem. So that's what we need to get people to un, white people to understand. And not only white people, Asian people too. Asian people is another pe people that we, we we never talk about because they they build stuff in our neighborhoods for years. A Chinese store in our neighborhood for years and then try to kick us out and get mad at us. You in our neighborhood. They've been in our neighborhood for years. But they never, they never show homage to black people. They don't care. They don't never care. But but we don't say nothing about them because it's just they just we just let them do what they want. Because we, we eat their food. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. We are we are approaching almost time here, Doc. But I do want if there's anything else you would like to add, please like just drop us all, like drop the knowledge on, let us know. You got the floor. Go ahead. Um, I don't have nothing else. Um, I just appreciate my time. Thank you for um, bringing me up here. Um, I look forward to, to rewatching it and liking it. Um, 
Yeah, I have fun doing this. I like I like this podcast. I like I just like doing podcasts now. I don't know. I just it's a new thing. I like talking, having conversations. So um, yeah, anytime um, I'm happy to come back, and I'm glad that we was able to find the time and, and do this. Find it on Twitter Spaces. That's crazy, right? Dog, listen, man, listen. That's that, that's wild. I mean, that's that's the that's the king of Twitter right there over there to the right. Not me. Like he he's he's the he's the connoisseur of Twitter. But listen, listen, man. Like Doc, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Duff, you have any closing statements? No, no closing statements. No closing statements. Well, this is the podcast and show show. I've been your host, Vanessa Belli. I'm here with Duff No Beer and my man Doc Lou Allen. Don't call him by his first name. Call him by Doc. All right, everybody. Listen, appreciate everyone. Have a good day, all right? Thanks, yeah. Peace and love. Peace and love.